Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for this week's Thursday with AARP Wisconsin streaming show. I am Amber Miller, your host um, of the show and also the Associate State Director with AARP Wisconsin. We're very excited about today's show, but of course, there are a few announcements before we get to our special guest. So as always, please remember to check out the AARP Wisconsin website for all upcoming virtual events, information about the COVID vaccine, and articles, and that you could check anytime, 24 hours a day. If you're interested in volunteering with us, we are looking for virtual volunteers to help us during this pandemic. If you're interested in volunteers opportunities with AARP Wisconsin, please check below at the website. It'll have you input some information, which comes to our office, and then we will contact you. And as always, please remember the Friendly Voice Initiative, which um, launched last year. This is an initiative for members and non-members, people of all ages, that if you want to put a request in to talk to one of our uh, trained volunteers, you could do so by going to the website below. Otherwise, the phone number below, which will be coming up. This is just to hear a friendly voice on the other end of the telephone. You could put a request in for yourself or have a family member do it on your behalf. And please remember, it is free and you do not need to be a member. As we know, February is Black History Month. We are honored to um, participate in the show today, and we have two special guests. So before we get to them, I want to frame out this a little bit. Today, we are here to talk about the legacy of Val Phillips um, and also the initiative to erect a special statue um, outside the Wisconsin State Capitol sometime this year. And if you do not know who Val Phillips is, you will learn so much about her today. And if you do know about her already, you might actually learn um, some stuff that you might not have known about her. So we are honored to um, today to have her son, um, Michael Phillips, uh, once again, son of Val Phillips and also a retired attorney who resides in Milwaukee. We also have David Endress, who is the chair of the Val Phillips Task Force and also the lead counsel with American Family Insurance. So I'd love to welcome them both with us today. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hi, Amber. Hi. Amber, Hi. thanks for having us. Absolutely. So Mike, I'm going to start with you and I kind of framed it out that people might not know who your mother Val Phillips is. I'm very aware of her. She is a woman of many firsts, but can you share just a little bit about who Val Phillips was? Sure. Um, and again, thank you for having us, Amber. Thank you. Um, I, if, if there are people out there who don't know who she was, I'll just give a, a brief little recap of, of some of the things that, that she accomplished in, in her career. Um, in 1951, she graduated from um, the University of Wisconsin Law School. She was the first African-American woman uh, to do so. Um, in 1956, uh, she was the first African-American and the first woman elected to the Milwaukee Common Council. Uh, in 1960, she was the uh, first African American and, uh, excuse me, the first African American elected to the National Committee of either party. Uh, she was a Democrat. Hmm. Uh, in 1971, uh, she was appointed uh, the first African American and the first uh, judge, uh, woman judge in Milwaukee, excuse me, the first African American judge in Wisconsin. And in 1978, um, she was the first African-American and the first woman elected to statewide office in Wisconsin. Um, and, you know, that just gives a little bit of a, it's just a little bit of a, a, a taste of, of what she was. Um, for those who don't know, um, as a mother, uh, I would say that um, she was a woman who loved to laugh. My mom had a, uh, a thirst for laughter. And my father and my brother, and sometimes me, they were better at it than me, but they could, they could really get her giggling. And um, uh, I mean, it, it, there was a lot of laughter in our house, I can say that. 
Um, my dad had one of those labs that you could hear in a party. If you were, you know, on the second floor. I mean, he, he had one of those booming laughs. My mom had that high pitched giggle that that uh, those two in concert. They, they were just they were just laughing. You could you'd laugh just to hear him laugh. She was a uh, a big storyteller. My mom. Mm -hmm. Yep, she was a woman that if uh, you called, asked her a question on the phone particularly at, at halftime because she was a big Packer fan. <laughs> um, we would talk about, you know, who was doing what and why and how are we going to win this game. But um, in the midst of it, if you asked her a question about something, it was a five-minute answer. And she could tell stories. I mean, not not boring. It, it, would, it would wind you in. She was really good at that. Um, boy, for those who don't know uh, my mom, I guess um, – You know, Dave, we've got the website going on, and um, on the website that we've got, uh, we've got this initiative going, and we're going to try to raise this money for a statue. About halfway down, there is a there. Um, there's a documentary. If anyone would like uh, a real sort of an in-depth look at who my mom was, we finished this documentary about oh four years ago now, and uh, it it really does tell a ton. Um, I can say that my mom was a soft touch mm -hmm. and, um, I remember my father and my mother, um, telling stories to their friends while my brother and I were sort of dipping into the room about a time when they'd both graduated and uh, they'd opened a new practice in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Phillips and Phillips law, uh, Phillips and Phillips law, it remains. Um, I am, I'm still in, in charge of that thing. But when my dad and my mom started it, um, my father actually built it into the largest African-American law firm in the state of Wisconsin. He built it into Phillips, Phillips, Gambrell, Jones, and Stamper. But at the time, they were new law graduates, and they had this Phillips and Phillips law thing going on. And uh, my mom, uh, I think she, uh, in some way, ran. She, she had a client. And this client um, was in a sorry state. Uh, she had whatever it was. I don't know if it was a civil case. Probably was a civil case, but uh, she didn't have any money. And uh, my mom decided that she was just going to go ahead and, you know, do this, just represent her um, calm. And that's, you know, lawyers do that all the time. Over the course of litigation, I think my mom gave the woman a couple of thousand dollars just to, just to, to float her and whatever. You know, everyone's got their story. And... Um, this was not the first time this had happened. So I might, you know, they're struggling lawyers. They're brand new. And my father finally came to my mom and said, you know, Val, the, the, the point is to actually get money from, from, <laughs> from clients. You know, yeah. you, you don't give money to clients. Anyway, but that was her. When I moved uh, to Wisconsin, excuse me, I moved back to Milwaukee. I, I worked for years in Madison. And... Um, my, the company that I worked for suffered under Act 10 and um, sort of the evisceration of collective bargaining in public schools. And I came back to uh, Milwaukee to be around my mom. I opened, I reopened Phillips and Phillips Law. Mm -hmm. And I would say for the first four or five years of my practice, I, I came back in about 2000 and I think it was 2010. Uh, any client that um, my mom, any would go to my mother and say, you know, Mrs. Phillips, I certainly need your help in this. Oh, don't worry. I've got my son. I said, and don't worry about paying him. It, it's fine. You know? <laughs> that, that was, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was my mom. Um, bless her heart. And Mike, I know you talked or you, when you were kind of doing the intro, she is a, a woman of many firsts. Can you talk a little bit about, because she was um, uh, the first older woman and the first um, African-American on the Common Council you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about how how a rare occurrence that was, especially being not only African-American, but also a female? Yeah, sure. Um I mean, you know, I was just, uh, I was born in 1958, so and my mom was on the Common Council throughout um, the late 50s and early 60s, so I was just a kid, oftentimes, you know, peeking out the back of a window as someone dropped her off or, you know, at a car window, but um, I do know from experience that uh, there were many times my mom came home and uh, she was 
sometimes crying. Mm -hmm. um, it was very difficult for her to be the only um, black woman on the Milwaukee Common Council. This is just, these are white men and it's a bit of an old boys club and um, you know, those sorts of things still exist today. They were in full force back then. Um, they relegated her to some office that was, you know, it could have been a closet. Um, there was no bathroom services for her. Um, she went, uh, and she was pregnant with my, my older brother at the time in 1956. Um, it's funny, yesterday, Dave and I were a, a part of another one of these live feeds, and um, the person who monitored or moderated the uh, entire affair, uh, she gave a long presentation and was actually quite good. And one of the things that, that she brought to bear was that um, there was no bathroom for my mom. And she decided that she was going to um, use the men's room right there off of um, uh, the common council chambers. And uh, there, there was big upheaval about that. I mean, just using the men's room. My mother told me many times that she uh, suffered more indignity uh, on those, during those years for being a woman than she did for uh, being an African-American. Wow, and, and Mike, I know this is a question. Um, sometimes we give our guests some questions ahead of time and I'll just kind of talking about your mom with your grandparents, her parents, how do you feel like they kind of instilled, you know, empowering your mom to take the steps of, you know, possibly in law school, was that talked about or, you know, being an older person? If you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Um, my, my mother's parents, my grandparents, um, they, uh, oh boy, where to begin? This is probably too long a story. We don't have enough time okay. to, go, to go into. <laughs> You know how these things are, but my grandmother was uh, a matriarch. Um, she she was she really um, she pulled the range of the family. My grandfather um, he was a, a very talented individual. He ran a restaurant. He also ran a um, an auto body repair shop. Um, but he also sewed all the clothes in the family. He um, did anything that could be done with his hands. He could do. Um, there was. Uh, I forget his name, he was a lawyer, um, an African-American man, who uh, made a big impact on my mother a as a child. Um, and the story goes that, that he came to the house one day and um, I think my grandfather needed some sort of, not legal service, but legal advice. And he was so on point that, and everyone listened to him so, um, with such rapture that my mom, um, Sort of caught that bug, asked my grandmother, could she be a lawyer? And my grandmother immediately said, yes, of course you can. Mm -hmm. You can if you want to. Um, oh. And yeah, that's what, that's what fed her. And my grandmother, <clears throat> my grandmother was a woman who played cards. I, well, I shouldn't say this, it, it, but my, my grandmother was very um, outspoken. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I love her already. Um, and I have one more question for you, Mike, before we talk to Dave uh, a little bit about um, what's you know going on with the fundraising initiative. What was Val or your mom's impact during the was you know during the civil rights movement? If you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. What was her impact during the civil rights movement? Yeah. Um, she uh, there was an open housing. Well. <laughs> Suffice to say that my mother became aware of some of the dilapidated conditions um, in which black people lived in the late 1950s. They were both active, um, my, my parents, in the NAACP. Um, she worked for a time, um, this is probably not known, before my mom went to law school, after Howard University, she went to um, the teacher's college, what became UWM. Mm -hmm. um, in Milwaukee, she spent a year at, at uh, in Mitchell Hall, which was it was the um, I think it was Wisconsin or Milwaukee Teachers College, and um, it was through her time there that she got to know a number of people and visited folks in their homes, and um, she saw some things I think that um, really opened her eyes. Mm -hmm. um, when she decided that she was going to uh, submit a, uh, a fair housing ordinance uh, to the, the common council, 
it was on the backs of stories that she'd heard of people who had been trying to move out of uh, the inner city um, to places that they were simply redlined. They, they couldn't, they couldn't yeah. get there. Uh, people who were upwardly mobile. I mean, you know, people who worked for a living. Um, uh, a lot of the, the businesses that are gone in Milwaukee today, A.O. Smith, um, those sorts of smokestack industries mm-hmm. were providing decent jobs for African-American uh, families, but they couldn't move out of the neighborhoods. Um, she, I think she kept pushing that legislation in the Milwaukee Common Council for four years, um, almost uh, you know, every 90 days, every 60 days, mm-hmm. um, it was, it was, uh, voted down 18 to one every, every time. Mm-hmm. Um, she later uh, sort of joined forces with, uh, Father James Groppy. Mm-hmm. He was working out of, um, St. Bonaventure and, um, they decided that they were going to, uh, march across the 16th street viaduct into the near South side and, uh, in protest of uh, fair housing, and they did so for 200 straight days. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, through snow and, and rain, gloom at night, they would um, uh, sometimes get pelted by bags of urine and feces and oh. spit and rocks, and uh, but they kept it up. She was arrested. Um, in truth, there is a, a book uh, called Selma of the North. Um, that uh, it describes this entire uh, episode. And in many ways, uh, Milwaukee was the sort of the northern bastion of um, the fair housing civil rights movement. And that was on the uh, shoulders of my mother and father, James Crappie. Wow. Very um, moving. Thank you. And I will check out that book. I wasn't aware of it, but definitely something I should look into. Um, Mike, thank you so, so much. We're going to have you hold on just for a moment. Um, So, so David, thank you again for joining us. We know that the Val Phillips um, statue task force launched a fundraising effort. We were kind of actually talking before the show about that. Can you tell us how the idea came up? Um, to erect this statue of uh, Mrs. Phillips. Sure, yeah, thanks, Amber. Um, So last summer when the protests and the civil unrest were happening in downtown Madison, Mike uh, Johnson, who's the CEO of Boys and Girls Club of Dane County, was downtown working with the protesters and the, the local businesses down there trying to limit the violence and limit the damages. And in in a conversation with some of the protesters, he was made aware of the fact that there's very little uh, African-American representation in the state capitol, and certainly not on the capitol grounds. And Mike didn't know that, and none of us really knew that, never really had, had taken the time to think about it. Uh, so he did some research and discovered that that, in fact, was, was pretty much true. There are a few photos of African-American uh, individuals in the state capitol, uh, but there, there really aren't many, and there, in fact, are a few of Bell in in the Capitol. But those are about it. And so, recognizing that there's really no significant representation of the contributions that African Americans have made to the state of Wisconsin uh, in the state Capitol on the grounds, uh, Mike decided to take that on as his charge, and he wrote a letter to then Senator Risser, who was the chairman of the. Uh, state capital and executive residence board. That's the the committee that has to approve things like this. And that got the ball rolling. Uh, They started a petition. Uh, I I signed on to the petition unbeknownst to me. I had done some volunteer work with the Boys and Girls Club of Dane County and gotten to know Mike pretty well. Uh, Unbeknownst to me, when I signed the petition, Mike was behind it. The petition (laughs) didn't have any indication that it was Mike. Uh, when I discovered that it was, in fact, Mike, I called him and, and just thanked him because he's always been a great leader in the city of Madison, and, and particularly in times of strife when we need someone to step up and, and take the lead. Michael's always been uh, one of those individuals to step up. So I called him to thank him for his efforts uh, in this in this event, and he we started talking about this statue, and uh, he asked me to take on the task force lead, and uh, I was honored to do so. And, uh, and that's how we've got to where we are today. Great. And we will be pulling up the website right now. So, David, if you could um, maybe just kind of 
um, kind of talk about the website. We can scroll down, and I know we referenced it earlier with the uh, the documentary about um, Val, but I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, so obviously, a a, uh, a project like this requires several things, including the approval from the state of Wisconsin, and that's one thing that we're working on. Uh, but also, it, it requires private funding. So, we have launched uh, our fundraising campaign. We officially launched it uh, last Friday, and as of this morning, we are at a little over, yeah, a little bit under $189,000 of our wow. $250,000 goal. The $250,000 is approximately the amount that it will take for us to have the statue created and uh, installed at the Capitol, and then to pay, there's a, a maintenance fee that we'll, we'll have, a fund that we'll have to, to fund the maintenance fees going forward to maintain the, the statue into the future. Uh, so yeah, so we've officially launched our fundraiser. Uh, there's, this is the website. I think you can, you can get the URL from, uh, from the notes, but um, there, there's also, in addition to our fund, you know, being able to make uh, pledges through the, the fundraising piece of the website. It also has a lot of information, as you cited earlier about Val and, uh, and her amazing accomplishments. Um, that I highly recommend if anyone is interested in learning more about her to watch the, the PBS documentary. Mike had a big played a big role in, in that uh, documentary being produced. It's fantastic. It's about an hour. It's uh, it's amazing. I I tell Mike all the time and, and other people that are that are working with our committee that I really believe there's uh, there's a movie in here and, okay. and the, <laughs> the documentary will will sort of pique your interest in that. I I, I think there could be a movie. The book that Mike cited is also very good. There's a chapter of uh, in that book, uh, Selma of the North, about Val and, and the issues that and how she was involved in, the, particularly in the fair housing issues that were, mm -hmm. were being confronted during uh, during this mid '60s. Uh, so yeah, and, and we're working again. Like I said, we're working with the, the state capital executive residence board. Uh, we we made our proposal to them in, in late January. It, it was well received, though they didn't take a vote on it. We are now working with a subcommittee of that board to, uh, to that they're reviewing our proposal in a little more detail with the idea that they'll bring that back to the full board at their next meeting, which we anticipate will be in June. At that point, we anticipate we're going to receive the approval to do this and uh, and it, that will launch the process of, of actually getting the statue designed, manufactured, and then ultimately installed probably sometime in 2022. 2022, okay. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, Darren, could we pull up the first comment? There was a very nice comment from um, actually our state director, Sam. He goes, these are fa um, fantastic stories coming from the perspective of, of a son. Add so much unseen context to her story. And I 100% agree. And we appreciate you being so candid. Um, and like I said, you know, some of our viewers may not have heard of your mother. Some, hey, you know, may have, but at least, you know, the stories should pique people's interest of how amazing she was and how she paved the way for so many African American, African American women, and um, that she just like just kept striving every day. And if she had to use the bathroom, she used the men's bathroom. And that right there is, I love that story. Um, and it looks like we had one other question, but that looks like it was answered. Um, yeah, having a statue to recognize her and honor is a, uh, is a wonderful idea. Then we will we will make sure to our viewers the website. Um, it's a it's a little long, but we will put it into the notes of this video. Um, so if you're looking once again to view the documentary, which I will be looking at, um, or to read more information about the fundraising efforts, we enc encourage our viewers. Um, just made a donation and shared to Facebook. Let's do this. I agree. Thank you, Arlene. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Mike, what I would like to do is give you the final comments for today's show. It was um, just uh, very inspiring and I think empowering to a lot of people who need those stories right now. So I will leave you the last minute or so, maybe just to kind of any last comments to our viewers who don't know about your mom or who are looking maybe to, you know, um, you know, volunteer or give back to their community or how they can, you know, be a better uh, member of their community. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, I wish I had I had more that I could go into. Um, and, you know, so to wrap up, all I can say 
is that uh, my mother believed that um, you should dream big dreams. And that's one of the things that she told me my and my brother my whole life, that um, if you dream it, you can do it. Um, one of her favorite quotes was uh, by Norman Vincent Peale, and it goes, um, um, shoot for the moon. Um, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. And so, Mike, I want to thank you and David. I want to thank you for both of your time. It was just eye-opening, inspiring um, for everybody to just hear the story of how amazing your mother was and how she just paved the way for so, so many people and what we're still unfortunately still fighting for today, but your mom definitely made an impact. So I want to thank you both um, for sharing your story today. And once again, please check out the website. We're going to put it in the notes. Um, if you're looking to maybe donate or if you're looking for information on Val or to watch a documentary. So thank you guys so much for next thank week's you, show. Thank you. For next week's show, we will be joined by two of our AARP Community Challenge winners from last year. So if you recall, we had four winners from the state of Wisconsin. We're going to be talking to two of them next Thursday at noon central. And also we have some upcoming virtual events that you may want to check out. Um, AARP, oh, sorry, February 26th, Movies for Grownups, Amazing Grace, Protecting Your Personal Information Online, March 1st. And then March 4th, the Girlfriend Virtual Happy Hour, which is the pandemic anniversary edition. As we know, we are coming up to the one year mark um, when COVID really hit us. If you're looking to um, uh, register for any of those, uh, the website was below, or you can call the 1877 number. So once again, I want to thank everybody, everybody for joining us today. I loved um, our guest, and I think it gives us a lot to think about. Um, so please feel free to share this video on your Facebook or YouTube page, and or you can um, take your friends and family in it. Otherwise, we will see you next Thursday. Be well.